I, uh, it's good, great to be with everybody today, and hopefully you're encouraged as you're here and getting to see some familiar faces and somewhat friendly faces here. That's what we try to be anyway. And uh, I'm excited to, uh, to be with you guys and to be able to share a little bit. Um, from this passage in uh, Mark 8, I call it, uh, I see trees in the Messiah, and you'll see why in just a minute. Uh, based on uh, what this guy that gets healed there of his blindness. But, uh, you know, I don't know exactly what, what your week has been like or what, like Jason mentioned in the beginning, how you are when you're coming in here. If you're skipping, I think he used the word skipping, uh, or if you're just trying to figure out your life. And, you know, I feel like this week was a week, and this has nothing to do with the passage, so you don't have to really listen if you're, if you're one of those people. But I feel like God teaches us lessons all the time, and sometimes we're, we're listening, and sometimes we're not really listening. And I think the, one of the lessons from this week, uh, at least for me, is to do the things that only you can do for God in life. You know, we spend so many times doing all kinds of different things, but there's only certain things in your life that only you can do. Like if you have kids, no one else can be a parent to your kids except you. So when you have that situation, it's kind of like, okay, this is my job from God, right? I'm the only one that can do this job, and now God help me to do it uh, with all your strength. I know we had a number of people that went, uh, like Jason said, about 18 people went to the marriage retreat here locally. If you have a spouse, you're the only one that can be the spouse to your spouse, right? You're the only one that can love, encourage, respect, honor them, and so that's something that just as the people of God, we got to take that seriously. Like, hey, this is my, my role. Um, this week I got to go to, um, or, or my son, oh, separately here, my son's out hiking right now as we're, as we're here. He's been out on the John Muir Trail for about a week, six days by himself. He's out there. He can text us through a satellite phone, but that's the only contact we have with him. And he's alive. He's doing well. He made it six days. So, But it makes you want, think about it. Like the first night he was gone, I don't think either of us slept real well because you're just like, okay, I'm in my comfy bed. I'm watching TV. I'm going to sleep. And he's out in like 40-degree weather, out in the middle of nowhere, setting up a tent just by himself. It, just, it makes you appreciate what we have, all the comforts and everything, but it just makes you appreciate uh, your kids, you know, life, and just how, um, how good we have it. You know, I, I never took my bed so much for granted as for that night, thinking, man, this is pretty nice. I got to, I was invited to the, uh, an opening by the city of Palm Springs uh, and Martha's Village of a homeless uh, community there. They, they opened up like 80 different units. And, and so just to be there and get into, uh, I got to meet one of my friend at Martha's, her boyfriend, and we were walking in and just getting to talk to him and met a, talk with this woman who's running for office, who's one of Chloe's kind of mentors. So it was just just, I'm not really a big political person, so I'm, I'm not, I don't really want to, like, get a black tie on and go hang out with all the uppity ups. But it was just one of those times, and you're like, man, this is really good to be here. You know, this is something that only I can do, you know, because of where I'm at and because of what, you know, being on the board with Martha's and just, you never know. Uh, and then we, we got to spend time with Nate Yester. Many of you know the Yesters here for, for her birthday. And just thinking, like, wow, it's taken like 10 years, and we finally got the birthday invite, you know? Wow. So it, it's kind of like it takes a long time. And I know even as a church, a long time ago, we used to move ministers around a lot. And I was just like, wow, if we weren't here for this long, there's no way we would have gotten, you know, to be here and be around these people. And, you know, one of the couples there, you know, because of the relationships that they have with the Yesters, it made it, like, really easy, right? Because they already, like, trust us, and they already were asking questions. And the first thing one of the guys said when we sat down, he's like, man, 
from being around Darren and Nikki for so long, I see the relationships that they have with your kids, and I want that with my kids. I want to be connected with them when they're all grown up, and now they're like five and seven, but when they're all grown up, I want that. And so, th so he started asking, like, where do you go to church, and how can we want to come visit? And, and I was just thinking, like, wow, this is so good to be here and to have people that know you, that see your lives, and that are attracted because of who you are, not because of what you're saying. Darren and Nikki weren't even there. It was just because they've seen it over the years. And I know many of you could see that, have had that happen. And it just makes me feel like, man, there's a lot of great things that we do that we don't even realize. Our marriages, our lives, just doing the right thing when no one's looking, all those little things. And so if you don't get anything out of today, just to think about and pray about what, what is something this week that only I can do that God's put in front of me that no one else can do, and do that. Because it makes you a lot more confident, even when you're doing something, you're not thinking about, oh, what else do I have to do? Or maybe I need to do something else. But when you feel like, man, God has really put this on my mind and my heart, um, it gives us a lot more confidence as Christians. Amen? Amen. Uh, as we get started here, I want to show you this short clip of a video. I know we've been talking a lot about the Middle East with our missions contribution and with everything going on. We're taking up money to send over there. And I, I just... Uh, Mofid sent me this video. I just want to watch about 30 seconds of it. It's, it's not very exciting, it, like graphics-wise and music-wise, but just to take it in uh, to see this, to me, is Christians just living their life, what God has put them there, hanging out with displaced children, right? So they've gone down into southern Lebanon, and they're just ha hanging out with everybody, playing games, and just to think about as we're here going through our lives as Christians, that's them over there and what they're going through in their lives. So I'll have them uh, show you that for a few seconds. Josh, thank you. I, I just wanted to show that with you guys just so you can be praying for them and, you know, just so you, you know, get an idea. It just was kind of like makes you stop and think uh, how good we have it here and just to know that they're out there. Uh, you can, you know, just live in their, the best lives that they can for God. They're, you know, they're, they're uh, taking care of these kids and they're having just like an impromptu camp right there in the parking lot, and, and it's just really cool to see. So uh, as we get started, I want to say a prayer, and I want to remember, um, I want to remember uh, this family, uh, the Lemus family. They lost their son, Christian, this week in a car accident in Jerupa Valley. He was 20, and uh, he's, she was at, the mom is actually April's co-worker, and their kids grew up together, and they grew up going to birthday parties together, and so it's a pretty uh, tough time. Uh, for their family, for the school there, and so we're going to pray for them. And on a more uh, inspiring note here, I want to, uh, we're going to pray a little bit for Lamar's film, uh, 74, actually, uh, which is, have you, as you guys have heard him share about kind of the reuniting of him and his sister after 74 years. And uh, he's got a real 
passion for this movie, and uh, he's probably shared it with you if he's caught you any length of time. And uh, they're, they're praying about raising $24,000 to be able to get to the finish line to be able to do the movie. So uh, if you can help, help. If you can pray, pray, just that God will kind of make that happen, uh, as we were talking about before, just in, in his time. But uh, I have a feeling it's going to be something really special. You know, you don't always see it. Like, there's so many things that we know about that we don't really think, oh, that'd be a great movie. But somebody kind of gets it in their mind, like, oh, this is a great movie. And I think this is kind of one of those things. Uh, so let's pray for the family and uh, for, for our brother here, and, and then we'll get started. Uh, Father, we do thank you for this time to pray, and thank you for uh, just our brothers and sisters all around the world that are trying to live for you and loving you. Uh, I do pray for the uh, Lemus family, God, just uh, comfort them in their time of pain and struggle and and just no words, Father, to describe what they're going through. Just give them comfort, help them to uh, see you and to come together and with people that love them. I pray for everyone at the school as well, as I know it affects everybody. Uh, in, in a special way, I pray for uh, Lamar. I pray for his uh, film that he's been dreaming and working on and living. Uh, it's his life. And I pray for that 24,000 to come on in, Father, uh, as soon as possible. Uh, be with us today as we look into your word. Open up our eyes. Help us to see you in here. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's read Mark, Mark 8. I'm going to read 22 to 30. It says, They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. They took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village where he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him. Jesus asked, do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Crazy comment. Funny comment. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened and his sight was restored. And he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home saying, don't even go into the village. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. And this is an amazing passage. It's the only one that I could think of where Jesus only halfway heals somebody. Right? It's like you come to Jesus, you expect that you're going to be like better than new. But not this guy. He comes to Jesus and he's only halfway healed. And maybe that's encouraging for a lot of us because I feel like I still need healing even though I've been healed once. I need to be healed again. How about you? You know, I'm like, man, I, I met Jesus. How come I'm still not, like, fully healed? You know, he's kind of a parable living out what most of us live out in our lives. We've had an experience with Jesus, but we still need more. And we've changed some, but we still need a lot more. And really, he's a parable in a way to us, but in a, in a different way. He's a parable to the people reading the book of Understanding Jesus, the same thing. Understanding him a little, but not fully. More specifically, he's a parable of Peter, the apostle. Right? After this, Peter gets it. He sees Jesus as the Messiah. You're the one. And then right after that, he's like, you're the Messiah, but you're not going to the cross. And Jesus has to have a conversation with him. And Jason's going to be talking about that next week because at this point in the book, this is the second half where Jesus is heading to, towards Jerusalem and the cross and the resurrection. And so in so many ways, even if we've seen Jesus before, we still need to see him again. Even if we've been healed halfway, we still need to be healed a bit more, I believe. And some of the other uh, themes here of this, his sight being restored. That's throughout the whole gospel of just seeing Jesus and understanding 
and not missing it. And here he puts the disciples on the spot and says, okay, I know what everybody else says about me, but what about you? And it reminds me of Jesus with Peter after his resurrection. And he's, Peter's like, hey, what about John? And he's like, don't worry about John, Peter. you got to follow me. And I think in so many ways, our personal conviction is what Jesus is looking for. Not what everybody else says he is, but who we say we are. You know, I couldn't help but, uh, you know, because he mentions trees here, you know where I'm going with this? Half, I mean, it was like a gimme. Oh, where'd it go? Here it is. I, I had to, right? If you're visiting with us, I, have, I look for these opportunities throughout the year. This was one of them to talk about my trees. And right now, everything is going really well, but they don't look very great. Right? They've been beaten up by the sun, and they're not sure what month we're in. They think we're in October, but it still feels like we're in August, right? And I think a lot of ways, that's how I can feel at times, right? I know God is doing all kinds of things, but, man, on the, I'm feeling kind of burnt on the outside or tired, and maybe that's kind of where you are. And I still have hope for this little tree I put in the middle. It's my grapefruit tree that old Barry gave me a couple years ago. It I planted it. It died. I was depressed. I, I, did, I was lazy. I didn't take it back out of the ground. And then the next year, it grew again. And so I was like, OK, let me leave it there. This year, it grew a little bit bigger. And now at the end of the year, it's dead again. And so uh, Barry's saying it's time to kill it. I don't know about that. But I, I have, you know, I think about that. I have certain friends that are kind of like that spiritually, right? Every once in a while, they give you like a little burst and then they're just like it's it's gone right it's like well, where was that i don't know but we're still praying for those people in our lives right people that maybe they're not going to get it we hope they're going to get it you know we've seen glimpses of it we believe uh, so i keep that tree just as a reminder of like hey all of my dead friends out there spiritually they're going to come one day they're going to surprise me and maybe that'll be me too uh, maybe i'll surprise people with that um, so back to Jesus, it says he, uh, he restored the, the man's sight and he saw everything clearly. And you just get that idea of what he's hoping for all of us, that we could see clearly, even what I was talking about in the beginning. What does God want from me this week? What, where is he putting me? What, what, what direction is he leading me? And then he he says this kind of weird thing that he says throughout the book. Don't even go into the village, right? Don't go talking about this. Don't tell people about this, which could seem a little bit weird for us. But the idea is that popularity isn't what Jesus wanted. But it's what the disciples wanted. They wanted this movement to grow. They wanted it to be more powerful. They wanted it to take over offices. They wanted to kick out the Romans. They wanted it to go a whole different direction that didn't include the cross, which we're, you'll see that next week. But Jesus is like, no, that's, even though you want to go this way, I'm, I'm going that way, right? And I think even as a church, we want that, right? We, we want to grow. We want to get more influence on the community. We want to have more power to help God to spread his message. And that might not be a bad thing, but Jesus wants us to go to the cross. So in one sense, we might want to go over here, but he might want us to go a different way. The challenge for us is what does that look like? What does that way look like? Not the way of being popular, but the way of following Jesus, the way of humility the way of trusting God. The way of the cross is when people don't recognize you, when they don't know you, when they, when they walk right by you like you're not even there. That's, that's kind of what the cross is. Because you're not maybe going the way that people are looking for. You know, Jesus mentions where he's going and how he's going to be treated three different times. And every single time, his disciples are like, oh, no, that's not going to happen. 
Or, oh, if you're going to go away, then make me great. Right? They, they still didn't quite understand. They were still kind of half seeing. Right? And that's what this is all about. Even for us as Christians, we may, we're half seeing too. We want Jesus, we want the cross, but we're not, I'm not so sure we want all of it. I don't want all of it, if I'm being real honest, right? But I know that's the way that God's trying to see, show me sometimes. So he takes his disciples away to Caesarea Philippi. This is away from all the Jews. It's basically just off by themselves where they have no distractions, and he starts asking them about who he is, and they start mentioning the, the prophets because that's what people associated Jesus with. He's bringing God's message. If you read through the Gospels, he's challenging a lot of people. Right? He's, he's turning their world upside down. He's, he's helping them to understand things, even the disciples, things that they think they understand, but they really don't. And God calls us to be that way in, in so many ways, too. But I love that idea that here Peter, he, he understands for this moment who Jesus is. right? Him saying, you're the Messiah, it's not just the title, but he un he's understanding like this has been talked about for a long time. Like this has been building through Abraham and David, all these prophecies. And, you know, he's starting to understand like, wow, you are it, Jesus. You're everything. And I think for a lot of us, maybe, we've been, maybe you've been at that place before where you, in our community, what that would sound like is when you say, Jesus is Lord. That's, what that, that's that moment that he reached. Like, man, every, nothing else matters except you, Jesus. Whatever I wanted to do, that's nothing compared to what you want for me. You know, I'm, I'm giving myself to you. Right? Have you been there? Have you had that moment? Are you... You know, I think about Connor as he's out there for these couple of weeks and just seeing creation and just wondering, like, what is he thinking about? You know, when he looks up at the stars and just to have no noise for two weeks, you know, is that what he's experiencing, this kind of awe and recommitment? And that was Peter. He was having this time. He already seen a lot of miracles, a lot of amazing things he couldn't understand and maybe out here, when he went out on their little walkabout, maybe he had time to reflect and had time to think about that. And there's actually people that study this, as we learned a few years ago from David Bruce, there's a science of awe that they studied astronauts mainly that after they go into space and they see the world and they come back, it's like they're changed. Because they, they don't see countries, they don't see differences, they just see, hey, we're, 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 we're all together in this. It says they experience a heightened appreciation for the planet's fragility and a deep connection to humanity as a whole. And it's kind of a, a, a self-transcendence or shift. You know, that they come back wanting to do something. They, they come back wanting to help. They come back thinking of others. And in so many ways, even when we were on this birthday party, a couple of the people started talking to me about the universe and how big it is and how small we are. And it was a little bit crazy. But I remember thinking, like, wow, I don't think about that at all. I never think about that, right? I'm, I'm just thinking about what do I got to do and what's happening over here and how can I fix this and let me do my quiet times and whatever. But just taking time to be in awe of God, it changes you. It changes me. I think in so many ways that's what I need. That may be what you need. To just get some time, maybe don't even read your Bible, just go outside and think about how big God is and count that as your time with God. To, to be more in awe of who he is. Maybe you got to drive out to Joshua Tree and just look at the Milky Way. But to have more of an appreciation so that it, it can change us. And I think we've had that, but we need that again, just like the disciples. So as we take our communion together, think about this life that Jesus has for us.
Think about who you say Jesus is. Think about that conversation. What does everybody else think about Jesus here? And then what, what do you think? You know, what, what are you professing to him today? He boils it down in the next few verses. He says, whoever wants to lose to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? And that was one of those transcendent moments where they were thinking like, man, what am, what am I living for? What am I putting myself into? And really trusting Jesus with our whole lives, that can change us. Let's, let's think about that as we take our communion today. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you that we can come before you. Thank you for this chance to see again, to see better, to know you, God. I pray that you guide us. Help us not to waste our time on things that you don't want us to have anything to do with. Help us to put ourselves into your hands, uh, to follow your ways. Thank you for Jesus. And we pray. I pray for everyone here that you make their uh, task clear, even this week. God, what are the things that you want from them that only they could do? God, I, I believe that you have a, a great plan for us. Help us to see you greater. Help us to be in awe. Help us not just to think about ourselves, but to think about you and think about others. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his body and blood, for his death, his burial, and his resurrection that we uh, take in at this time. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.